Welcome back everyone. In the last video we talked some about how new neurons are born essentially, how they um, are produced and how they navigate the brain to where it is that they're going to live. So now in this lecture we're going to talk about what happens from there. Uh, cell differentiation, apoptosis, um, forming connections, synapses in the brain, all of that good stuff. So when the cells reach their final destination, they begin expressing certain genes. So this leads to the transcription of certain proteins that leads to differences in functions, appearance, etc. So this process is called cell differentiation. It's a process that allows the cell to acquire its specific appearance and function. We don't fully understand how this process happens, but we've identified two factors that influence the process. Since some cells develop characteristics that are independent of um, the neighboring cells, we know that some aspects of this process mustn't be based on the surroundings. So these are called cell autonomous differences. So they're called this because the differences are independent of the other cells in the environment and they're driven by genes that are intrinsic to the cell. So we know that's one aspect that um, affects the differentiation. And then as you could guess from that, the other aspect is the environment, the surrounding cells. So this is called neural environmental effects. Um, they're, it's essentially just that these cells are affected by the cells in their environment. So if, um, for instance, if you have a cell that ends up in the visual cortex, it's going to develop into a cell that fits the visual cortex, not one that fits the amygdala, for instance. So the environment also plays a huge role in cell differentiation. So the neurons get to their final resting locations. So what happens next? Well, next we have synaptogenesis, which is the process where you have um, synapses formed between these neurons. So this is kicked off by process outgrowth. So process outgrowth is the rapid growth of axons and dendrites. Of course, we need axons and dendrites in order to connect these neurons. So at the tips of the axons and dendrites are growth cones, like these. So growth cones are swollen ends from which extensions emerge, and those fine outgrowths are called philopodia. So there are your fine extensions there. Um, there are also lamellopodia, which are sheet-like extensions of growth cone. So these philopodia and lamellopodia pull the growth cone toward the target cell. It actually both of these are pulling the growth cone towards other neurons so that they can connect. So this is how the process is happening. So we have a lot of synapses uh, um, forming because you have this huge growth of both axons and neurons, and these growth cones are helping bring them together. So think of it as your e-harmony for axons and neurons. It's bringing them together. So how do the growth cones find their way? Well, there's actually, we have a reason for that. There are chemicals that either re attract or repel growth cones. So you have um, chemoattractants, so these are chemical signals that attract certain growth cones, and um, chemorepellents, which repel certain growth cones. So this is how you have you know, some differentiation in the brain, because you don't just want everything connecting to everything. You know, as you know, there are structures within the brain. You know, some neurons need to be connected to these, but not others. So this is how that differentiation happens, how that, those connection differentiations happen. So you have the chemoattractants to bring the, the connections and the neurons that need to be connected together together, and the chemorepellents to keep others away from that. So this, you know, for instance, um, probably the easiest way to understand this is, you, as you know, there are two hemispheres of the brain that are connected by the corpus callosum. So chemorepellents are really important for helping keep those two hemispheres separate other than that corpus callosum.
and then synapses form rapidly um, on the dendrites and the dendritic spines. So you have this brain um, connecting very, very rapidly. And you can see here um, just the number of synapses, you know, when you look at from the time of conception through birth, all these are increasing very, very greatly. And you see this even in the first year of life. Um, really um, profound expansive increase in the number of synapses through this process. So once the appropriate connections are made, there's actually a period of cell death or apoptosis. Um, this is a normal part of development during which about half of the neurons die. Uh, think of it as a sculpting process where the brain structures are being carved out of larger areas of stone. It's a vital process because, um, again, research shows that blocking the process in beetle mice leads to the brain outgrowing the skull, which is not a good thing. Um, so it appears that the neurons actually have genetically coded self-destruction mechanisms built in. So you have, you have caspases, um, which are a family of proteins that regulate apoptosis. And what they do is they cut up proteins and nuclear DNA within the cell. So we'll talk a little bit about how this process works in the next slide, but that's how it, that's how it kills the cell. So here we go. How does this process work? So first, there's a rapid influx of calcium. So you have all these calcium ions come in. And this causes the mitochondria of the cell to release a protein called Diablo. I love the name, Diablo. So the Diablo protein kits this process off. The Diablo protein binds to inhibitors of ATOP <laughs> inhibitors of apoptosis proteins. You gotta love these names. So um these are named, as you would guess, because they normally inhibit this process. But when the Diablo binds to these proteins, which normally in inhibit the process, um, what happens is that these um, caspases that we talked about before start running wild, um, and they dismantle the cell. So you have BCL2 proteins that also play a role in the process. They they help inhibit the release of Diablo, and they serve as a last check and balance in order to prevent unintentioned, unintentional self-destruction of the cell. Interestingly enough, though, the BCL2 gene is actually implicated in many cancers, including melanoma, breast cancer, prostate cancer, leukemia. So it actually suggests that decreased apoptosis may actually predispose someone to developing cancer. So, something interesting to consider. So, what happens, let's just go over this one more time because I think it's helpful. So, you have this influx of calcium, right? So, calcium ions coming into the cell, which leads to the mitochondrion releasing Diablo. So, you have Diablo here. Um, and the Diablo connects with the IAPs. Again, these are the... Um, these are the inhibitors of apoptosis proteins that are within the cell, and when they connect to them, then it no longer keeps these test bases in check. So the test bases go, they cut everything up, destroy the cell, cell dies. Made sense? Okay. So, how does the cell determine when to self-destruct? Well, there seem to be several factors. Cell death seems to be correlated with synaptic targets. So cells have cells that have adequate synapses with other neurons survive, whereas those that don't pass away. The thought is that this is um, the thought of how this happens is that cells need certain chemicals that are called neurotropic factors, um, and they get these from target cells. If they don't get enough of these neurotropic factors, then apoptosis occurs. So that's one way that the cell may be able to determine, you know, do I am I connected enough? Yes or no. If yes, then I'm okay. I don't I don't do apoptosis. If no, then I go ahead and engage in apoptosis and that cell dies. So 
Lastly, after the neuronal death, there is um, synapse rearrangement. So you have new synapses forming, other ones, you know, dying off. So synapse rearrangement is the refinement of synaptic connections. The arrangement can be due to many factors, as we'll talk about. So one can be due to neuronal death or duplication. Um, so obviously neuronal death we just talked about. So if a neuron dies, then it's the other neurons are going to make new connections. Uh, duplication is a little different, as you could guess. So for instance, if you have a motor neuron, um, synapses retract if a muscle is innervated by more than one motor neuron. So if you have duplication that's unintended, then you'll have the synapses retract, so there's only one um, neuron innervating a, a motor neuron. So you see this rewiring because of duplication, because of cell death, and you also actually see it because of neuronal activity, which seems to affect the connectivity, um, similar to what you see later in development. So the, this whole process, the process of synaptic rearrangement, actually continues into one's 20s, so it happens for a long time. And, and there's evidence that some rewiring happens long after that. So if you learn a new skill, there's still that brain plasticity and rewiring, but this active rearrangement continues into one's 20s. So overall, there's a net loss of synapses that actually happens from late childhood to mid-adolescence. Uh, there's also, around that time, um, many psychiatric disorders develop, which has made some wonder whether or not this synaptic pruning could be partially responsible for psychiatric illnesses, such as schizophrenia and mood disorders. So once you have the connections, of course, as we've discussed before, you have myelination. So glial cells are added throughout life, and one of the main purposes of glial cells are to myelinate these axons so the connections are faster. So again, as you know, myelination by glial cells increases the rate at which axons can send messages. And then multiple sclerosis, as we've discussed before, destroys myelin and disrupts sensory and motor function. What it actually does is it desynchronizes the activity in the brain, which really causes a lot of disruption for the sensory and motor systems. And lastly, genes, of course, can also affect brain development. With genes, there are two important terms to know, genotype and phenotype. So once genotype is all of their genetic information, so everything they've inherited, whether it's expressed or not. So as you know, not all of these genes are expressed. So the phenotype is um, the sum of an individual's physical characteristics at any particular time. So essentially the phenotype is what's being expressed. So our genotype stays constant, but our phenotype is constantly changing based upon our genes and their interaction with the environment. So thus brain development can be affected through one's genes as we see with Down syndrome for instance, but they can also be affected by the environment, which is what we'll get into in the next two video lectures.